Let's talk math. Okay, don't run away. I know math isn't for everyone, and this isn't going to turn into a math channel. We're still talking about horror. But since I am a math person, to the extent that one of my degrees is in mathematics, I can't help but talk about how math intersects with the horror genre in some interesting ways. Of course, I hear a lot of you screaming that math is fairly horrific, but that's not what we're talking about today. Instead, I'm going to try to help you all understand how horror maestro H.P. Lovecraft made use of some rather deep mathematical ideas in his work. I'm a Lovecraft fan. In fact, I'm even a lifetime member of the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, as you can see here. One of the things I've noticed hanging around some of the Lovecraft pages on social media is that a lot of people have noticed that Lovecraft wrote a fair amount about non-Euclidean geometry, but relatively few of those people have a very deep understanding of what non-Euclidean geometry is. Or even what Euclidean geometry is, for that matter. So that's our business today. We're not going to do any difficult calculations or anything of the sort, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how mathematics interacts with Lovecraft's mythos, focusing particularly on non-Euclidean geometry. The first order of business, I think, is to know a little bit about Lovecraft himself. His own interests, passions, and fears profoundly influenced the horrors of which he wrote, and he was quite passionately interested in the sciences, particularly in astronomy. In fact, he'd even considered a career in either astronomy or chemistry, but he struggled with mathematics, algebra in particular. In 1931, he wrote, In studies I was not bad, except for mathematics, which repelled and exhausted me. I passed in these subjects, but just about that. Or rather, it was algebra which formed the bugbear. Geometry was not so bad, but the whole thing disappointed me bitterly, for I was then intending to pursue astronomy as a career. And of course, advanced astronomy is simply a mass of mathematics. About that, Lovecraft was absolutely correct. If anything, the mathematics in modern astrophysics has only gotten even more gnarly since Lovecraft's day. After all, Einstein was one of Lovecraft's contemporaries, and the Einsteinian model of cosmology, and the various subsequent refinements thereof, requires significantly less intuitive mathematics than the Newtonian view, which itself is mathematically heavy enough to turn off most people. However, though mathematics was not Lovecraft's strong suit, he clearly followed contemporary science with great interest, and much of what he read found its way into his work. His mythos involves, as we'll focus on here, non-Euclidean geometries, which are intimately linked with modern cosmology, as well as interdimensional beings and a variety of horrors clearly inspired by the newly developing cosmology. For example, one of the key insights in Einstein's theories of relativity is that it's not so much correct to think of our universe as three-dimensional as we're all comfortable with. Instead, we must conceptualize time as another dimension perpendicular to the other three spatial dimensions. That is, Einsteinian physics takes place not in three spatial dimensions, but in four-dimensional space-time. And take it from me, Trying to learn to think in four spatial dimensions, as Einstein occasionally demands of us, is not an easy task. A professor of physics once confided in me that the only time he'd actually managed to do it was while under the influence of the kinds of substances of which I don't approve. One of the easiest to state and most difficult to understand ideas for a lot of people is that the universe is expanding. Intuitively, we take it to mean that all of the things in the universe are expanding out into empty space. But that's not actually what the science is telling us. Space itself is expanding. And trying to picture that is incredibly difficult, because in order for something to expand, it seems like it requires an empty space into which to expand. But it's not that galaxies and nebulae and particles are expanding into space. Rather, it's that space itself is expanding. Into what is it expanding? 
One way to conceptualize it is that it's not expanding into anything, but it's, it's merely the stretching of space. Another way to think about it is that it's expanding into the future, into that fourth dimension of time. Bringing things back to Lovecraft, consider his most famous creation, Great Cthulhu, one of the great old ones. In The Call of Cthulhu, Lovecraft wrote the following. These great old ones, Castro continued, were not composed altogether of flesh and blood. They had shape, for did not this star-fashioned image prove it? But that shape was not made of matter. When the stars were right, they could plunge from world to world through the sky. Putting aside the astrological part about the stars being right, this plunging from world to world sounds a lot like a description of an extra-dimensional being, which we can't fully comprehend in our three spatial dimensions, but which can nevertheless interact with our three spatial dimensions from outside or from another dimension. If we lived in two-dimensional space, we'd have no concept of a three-dimensional being. Imagine we are such flat beings. Then someday a three-dimensional being passes through our flat world. Having no concept of the up-down dimension, we can never interact with its full form. We would only be able to see a sort of cross-section of the being, and its shape would morph strangely as it passed through our plane of existence. It might cast strange shadows or projections from a dimension we can't comprehend. Though it's difficult to picture a four-dimensional entity, we can imagine what its shadow might look like in three dimensions. Let's consider a simple example. First, let's think of a zero-dimensional shape. Because it has no dimensions, it exists only as an infinitesimal point. Now, obviously, this point actually has dimensions, but we're picturing it as a zero-dimensional point. When we move up to a single dimension, we can picture it as a line. This has length, but no width or height. Now we add another dimension, turning 90 degrees from our line, and we get a square, or in this case, a rectangle. The second dimension is perpendicular to the first dimension, and we now have length and width, but still no height. Add a third dimension perpendicular to the other two, and we can form a cube. And you see which cube I've chosen. This is about as far as we can go in our ordinary experience, but nothing in mathematics prevents us from adding a fourth dimension. This fourth dimension is perpendicular to the other three. That is perpendicular to all three of the other dimensions. But since we think in three spatial dimensions, it's hard to grasp what that would look like. The important thing to remember is that all of the angles must be right angles, just as all of the angles in the cube are right angles. Though we struggle to picture what a four-dimensional cube, called a hypercube or a tesseract, would look like, we can easily figure out what its shadow would look like in our three spatial dimensions. It's similar to the way we can visualize a three-dimensional cube on a two-dimensional screen with a drawing like this one. In fact, this animation that you're seeing on your screen shows what that projection might look like. Of course, you're watching this on a flat screen, so what you're actually seeing is just a two-dimensional perspective drawing of the three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional object. It can get confusing rapidly, but hopefully it gives you some idea what we're talking about. I also have this Klein bottle. This is a one-sided bottle. The inside and the outside are continuous. This is a shape that can exist in four spatial dimensions without any trouble. However, because we live in three spatial dimensions, it has to intersect itself here in a way that it wouldn't have to do in four spatial dimensions. In four spatial dimensions, we can make the inside and the outside of the bottle continuous without self-intersection. The reason I mention all of this is that it seems very much like Lovecraft has described Cthulhu as a four-dimensional being. He and the other Great Old Ones don't exist fully in our spatial dimension, but they can nevertheless interact with our world. One of the things people struggled with in Lovecraft's time, and indeed even today, is that science has revealed our universe to be stranger than we'd ever imagined. It's no wonder Lovecraft took some of those ideas and populated the world with monsters beyond human comprehension. 
But the main focus of our discussion here isn't four-dimensional space-time, it's non-Euclidean geometry. But those topics are closely related. Lovecraft made several references to such non-Euclidean geometries throughout his writing. Again, in The Call of Cthulhu, he wrote that the city of Relyech, Cthulhu's resting place, has geometry characterized as abnormal, non-Euclidean, and loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart from ours. Non-Euclidean geometry, and mathematics in general, plays an even larger role in Lovecraft's story, The Dreams in the Witch House. In this story, a young math student, Walter Gilman, takes residence in a house formerly inhabited by an accused witch, Keziah Mason. At one point in the story, Keziah describes lines and curves that can point through the walls of space and into other dimensions. Sounds very much like our four-dimensional space, you know? Furthermore, it's mentioned early in the story that Gilman is studying non-Euclidean calculus. Trying to make sense of that term in a note in the new annotated H.P. Lovecraft, Leslie Klinger writes the following. A nonsensical term, as Robert Weinberg demonstrates in H.P. Lovecraft and pseudo-mathematics, because there is no real connection between geometry and calculus. Gilman speculates on four-dimensional objects, but necessarily such an object cannot be constructed in a three-dimensional system. Donald R. Burleson disagrees in a note on Lovecraft, Mathematics, and the Outer Spheres, arguing that Lovecraft merely imagined realms in which such common geometric notions as distances have no ready meaning. For example, he argues, a mathematician may work with the abstract structure called a locally compact topological group, and in that context define an abstract measure and what is called the Haar integral, so that even in this wholly abstract setting one may do a kind of calculus. These are deep waters indeed. We're not going to settle that debate entirely here, because to be honest, they're both right to an extent. Of course we can imagine doing calculus in four dimensions. Even an elementary course in multivariate calculus gives you the tools that you would need to do so. However, simply doing calculus in extraspatial dimensions, or in a non-Euclidean space, doesn't necessarily lead to the kinds of sanity-sapping horrors that Lovecraft wrote about. The mathematics here are real, but their use in Lovecraft is a kind of pseudo-mathematics. More importantly, though, we again see that term non-Euclidean. Just what does that actually mean? Well, to understand what non-Euclidean geometry is, it probably makes sense to start with Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is named for the Greek mathematician Euclid, whose book The Elements marks one of the earliest attempts at formally proving numerous results in geometry, but also in number theory and other branches of mathematics, beginning with only a few simple axioms. The idea is to assume as few things as possible simply as a matter of faith, but then to use those to prove more interesting results. Euclid began his project with a list of 23 definitions, things like a line is a breadthless length, as well as five common notions. These are notions like things which are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. Finally, he set forth five postulates. These postulates are the axioms of the Euclidean system. They're meant to be the uncontroversial things we can assume without proof, so that we can use them to prove other results. Let me read them out for you. Let the following be postulated. 1. To draw a straight line from any point to any point. 2. To produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line. 3. To describe a circle with any center and distance. 4. That all right angles are equal to one another. And 5. That, if a straight line falling on two straight lines make the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which are the angles less than the two right angles. Did you notice that one of these things is not like the others? That fifth postulate, called the parallel postulate, basically means that if you're given some line and some point not on that line, there is exactly one line, parallel to the first line, which includes the point. And that parallel postulate plagued mathematicians for centuries, even for millennia. 
Unlike the other four postulates, it doesn't seem like the kind of self-evident statement we should be able to take without proof. It seems like we should be able to prove it. But Euclid never could prove it. However, it also seems like Euclid himself was similarly uncomfortable with his fifth postulate because he carefully avoided its use for as long as he could. He managed to f prove his first 28 propositions or theorems without having to invoke the dreaded parallel postulate. But eventually he had to use it and he did so throughout the remainder of his work. Throughout the following centuries and millennia, mathematicians tried and failed to crack the parallel postulate. As William Dunham explains in one of my favorite books about the history of mathematics, Journey Through Genius, the nature of the parallel postulate remained unresolved through the Renaissance. Whoever deduced the parallel postulate would have been guaranteed everlasting fame in the annals of mathematics. At times the proof seemed tantalizingly close, yet it evaded the efforts of the world's finest mathematical minds. Then, in the early 19th century, three mathematicians simultaneously had the burst of insight necessary to see the matter in its true light. The first was the incomparable Carl Friedrich Gauss. Gauss recast the issue in terms of the degree measure of the angles of a triangle. Wanting to prove that the triangles must contain 180 degrees, he assumed for the sake of argument that they did not. This left him with two alternatives, that triangles have more than 180 degrees in their angles or that they have less. He proceeded to investigate these two cases. Gradually, as Gauss delved more and more deeply into this peculiar geometry, he became convinced that no logical contradiction existed. Rather, he began to sense that he was developing not an inconsistent geometry, but just an alternative one, a non-Euclidean geometry, in his words. Gauss said as much in a private letter of 1824. Yet Gauss, universally regarded as the foremost mathematician of his day, did not publicize his findings. Perhaps the burdens of fame figured in his decision, for he was certain the controversial nature of his position would cause an uproar that might jeopardize his lofty reputation. Next entered the Hungarian mathematician Johann Bolyai. Johann's father Wolfgang had been an associate of Gauss and had himself spent much of a lifetime in a futile attempt to prove Euclid's postulate. In an age when sons often took the professions of their fathers, be they clergymen or cobblers or chefs, we have here the younger Bolyai taking from his father the rather esoteric career of trying to derive the parallel postulate. Wolfgang, however, knew all too well the difficulties of such a career and wrote this strong warning to his son. You must not attempt this approach to parallels. I know this way to its very end. I have traversed this bottomless night, which extinguished all light and joy of my life. I entreat you, leave the science of parallels alone." The young Johann Bolyai did not heed his father's advice. The book goes on to describe some of his work and then, but Johann's ego had one more trial to endure, for it soon came to light that a Russian mathematician, Nikolai Lobachevsky, not only had traveled the same path as Gauss and Bolyai, but had published his own account of a non-Euclidean geometry in 1829, a full three years before. Lobachevsky, however, had written his treatise in Russian, and it had apparently gone unnoticed in Western Europe. We have here a phenomenon not uncommon in science, that of a discovery made simultaneously and independently by many individuals. The impact of these discoveries had barely struck home when yet another innovator, Georg Friedrich Bernhard Riemann, adopted a different viewpoint about the infinite lengths of geometric lines. And the book continues with the history. So we have several mathematicians who all managed to crack the puzzle at around the same time. I've deliberately left out some of the details of their solutions from that reading, you can read the book if you want to, but I'll explain some of it now. What these mathematicians figured out was that indeed you do need to treat Euclid's fifth postulate as axiomatic. It cannot be proved. However, it's not the only way things can be. There are other possible geometries that operate under alternative parallel postulates. Euclidean geometry is what we're all familiar with. It's what we all learned in school if we were lucky enough to have a half-decent geometry class. Euclidean geometry exists in a flat plane, so we could also call it planar geometry. But what if, instead of a plane, we have a curved surface on which to perform our geometry? Then we're in the world of non-Euclidean geometry. 
To make things even more complicated, there are two kinds of non-Euclidean geometry, spherical and hyperbolic. A good way to visualize these geometries is to take a walk through the park. If I'm in a Euclidean space, everything seems just the way we expect it to. I'm walking along a flat planar surface. But if we shift into a spherical geometry, I find myself walking on the surface of a sphere. Obviously, the rules of geometry are going to be a little bit different. On the other hand, we can also switch into a different geometry, a hyperbolic space, and then I find myself in a space that seems even more alien to our minds than either the plane or the sphere. What are the consequences of these non-Euclidean geometries? Well, there are many, some more surprising than others. But one that's fairly easy to grasp has to do with the interior angles of triangles. You may remember from middle school or high school geometry that the three interior angles of any triangle always add up to 180 degrees, exactly 180 degrees. It doesn't matter what triangle you draw. It could be a right triangle, it could be isosceles, scalene, whatever. It will always be 180 degrees. Well, that assumes a flat Euclidean space. In a non-Euclidean space, triangles behave differently. Consider this globe as an example of a spherical surface. Let's start by drawing a line at a 90 degree angle up from the equator. Trace that all the way up to the North Pole, and then make another 90 degree angle, and follow it back down to the equator, make a third 90 degree angle, and then rejoin the original angle. We've created a perfectly valid triangle. It has three sides and three angles but the interior angles add up not to 180 degrees, but to 270 degrees. Put another way, in a spherical geometry, the interior angles of a triangle add up to more than 180 degrees. Conversely, in a hyperbolic geometry, the interior angles add up to less than 180 degrees. Lovecraft's mathematics in Witch House continue. Later on, through supernatural intervention, Gilman essentially, perhaps unwittingly, sells his soul for mathematical knowledge. It's not a conscious decision so much as just that his overwhelming curiosity leads him to dark places. Fairly early in the story, he writes, Toward the end of March, he began to pick up in his mathematics, though other studies bothered him increasingly. He was getting an intuitive knack for solving Riemannian equations, and astonished Professor Upham by his comprehension of fourth dimensional and other problems which had floored all the rest of the class. One afternoon there was a discussion of possible freakish curvatures in space, and of theoretical points of approach or even contact between our part of the cosmos and various other regions, as distant as the farthest stars or the transgalactic gulfs themselves, or even as fabulously remote as the tentatively conceivable cosmic units beyond the whole Einsteinian space-time continuum. Gilman's handling of this theme filled everyone with admiration, even though some of his hypothetical illustrations caused an increase in the always plentiful gossip about his nervous and solitary eccentricity. What made the students shake their heads was his sober theory that a man might, given mathematical knowledge admittedly beyond all likelihood of human acquirement, step deliberately from the earth to any other celestial body which might lie at one of an infinity of specific points in the cosmic pattern. Some of this is pure nonsense, of course, and some of it reflects real ideas. The idea that extreme curvature of space-time could connect distant points of the universe, or possibly even parallel universes, has been toyed with by physicists over the years, but it's very much at the fringes of our understanding, even today, and may or may not be possible. With regard to these Riemannian equations, a bit more explanation is necessary. All Leslie Klinger writes in the annotated Lovecraft is, Georg Friedrich Bernhard Riemann, a German mathematician who essentially single-handedly developed the field known as Riemannian geometry, the study of higher dimensions and the extension of differential geometry in n dimensions. Riemann's work was vital to Einstein's theory of relativity. Thomas Pynchon's brilliant 2006 novel Against the Day explores in part the darkly cosmic aspects of the work of Riemann and his students. Other commentaries I've seen over the years have connected that line about Riemannian equations with a vague reference to the Riemann hypothesis. And indeed, in name, there is a relationship there. 
The Riemann hypothesis is a famous unproved conjecture in mathematics with profound implications for our understanding of the distribution of prime numbers. We're not going to go into that in detail here because even to understand the problem, much less attempt a solution, requires graduate study in mathematics. Though I will say that there's a million dollar prize and eternal glory for anyone who finally manages to solve the puzzle. But the Riemann hypothesis isn't really connected to our ideas of non-Euclidean geometry and higher dimensional spaces. It just happens that the same mathematician worked in both areas of mathematics. What Lovecraft really seems to be writing about when he references Riemannian equations are, rather, Riemannian manifolds. So what's a manifold? Well, as you'll recall from a moment ago, Riemann wasn't the first, but was among the first to study the non-Euclidean spaces. He also took the idea much farther, applying the concept of a surface, particularly a non-Euclidean surface, to higher dimensionalities. As such, he needed a word to refer to a higher dimension surface. Writing and lecturing in German, he chose the word Mannigfaltigkeit, which was later translated into English as manifold. A manifold is a topological space of any number of dimensions. A two-dimensional manifold is a surface, just as we're familiar with, but we needn't be limited to surfaces only. Manifolds, at least in pure mathematics, can exist in any number of dimensions. Interestingly, though an entire manifold may be non-Euclidean, it can be what we call locally Euclidean, which means it resembles a Euclidean surface at a small enough scale. The surface of the Earth is a fine example. When we wander around town, the surface of the Earth seems flat, hills and potholes notwithstanding. Even though we know our planet is actually nearly spherical, we don't perceive that curvature in day-to-day -day life. On our human scale, the Earth's surface is locally Euclidean. The remarkable thing about all of this isn't just that Lovecraft picked up on a mathematical term from his extensive reading of science, but that there's actually a certain degree of sense to what he was writing about. It turns out the universe is far from Euclidean. It only seems locally Euclidean to us, but Einstein showed that the fundamental geometry of space-time is far more esoteric than we previously imagined. Writing at a time of immense scientific revolution, Lovecraft capitalized not only on his passion for the sciences, but also his, and everyone's, fears about the strange and unknown universe unfolding around us. Scientists may not have discovered Cthulhu at the end of their equations, but the Great Old Ones stand metaphorically as representations of the incomprehensibility of the universe we find ourselves in. But that doesn't prevent people from misunderstanding Lovecraft's use of non-Euclidean geometry. On the one hand, there are those who have no idea what non-Euclidean geometry even is, and they simply think it means something like weird geometry. There's no depth to that level of understanding. But on the other hand, there are those who do have some idea of what non-Euclidean geometry is, but they fail to grasp the depths of Lovecraft's own understanding. To an extent, I understand that latter point of view. Understanding that even the spherical surface of the Earth is a non-Euclidean surface seems to take some of the fear out of these geometries. I've heard people say things like that Lovecraft was simply afraid of mathematics he didn't understand. One blogger, to whom I'll link down in the what's it, said he heard people write things like non-Euclidean geometry is just geometry on a sphere and so Lovecraft must have been afraid of spheres. But that relates a fundamental misunderstanding. When describing the architecture of Rilieck, for instance, Lovecraft wasn't just describing strange and curvy architecture. I've seen buildings that have spherical and hyperbolic surfaces, even in this world. Rather, Lovecraft was saying that the space itself was non-Euclidean, not just the architecture. Our minds can easily process a non-Euclidean shape as long as the world itself remains fundamentally Euclidean. Where things get a lot weirder are when the space is also non-Euclidean, because then not only are the objects in that space oddly shaped, but light will travel strange pathways, and indeed everything will seem rather alien to our little Euclidean monkey brains. Indeed, buildings wouldn't just exist in strange shapes, but those shapes would seem to morph as we move around them and see them from different perspectives. In fact, it's difficult for us to even comprehend how strange it would be to live in, for example, a hyperbolic space. 
The best I've been able to accomplish is by filming spherical video and then compressing it into a flat rectangular frame, as you can see as I take a quick stroll into the non-Euclidean space that exists within my shed. Of course my shed is a non-Euclidean space. After all, it is where my monsters live when they're not out doing their spooky business. So we can see that despite his own mathematical limitations, Lovecraft was actually writing about something rather deeper than a lot of people give him credit for, even if he did only ever mention the specific phrase non-Euclidean in The Call of Cthulhu and The Dreams in the Witch House. I suppose the only question that remains is whether, as sometimes happens in Lovecraftian stories, mathematics can actually drive a person insane. But that is a subject for another video. So be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss that or any of my other wonderful videos. While you're at it, leave me a like and a comment, and do share this video with all your friends. Help get the word out about all the horror goodness I have to offer. As always, check out the video description for more information, links to books and products you saw in the video, and to learn about my other projects, including the Do You Like Scary Movies podcast, the Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society, and everything else that's happening in my weird little corner of the world. With all that having been said, until next time, take care and stay scared.